by the same spider that gave Peter Parker his amazing power, Cindy Moon is Silk, the next generation of Spider Hero. Let's see what happens to her next, shall we, in the pages of Silk number one. The comic opens with Silk duking it out with a brand new armored supervillain calling himself Dragon Claw, to which Cindy Opine sounds a lot like a Pokemon then wonders if Pokemon is even a thing. Keep in mind she lost years of her life being locked up in Ezekiel's secret bunker. The bad guy gets away, but Spider-Man swings by, and the two have a little heart-to-heart. -heart. Spider-Man, of course, having a sympathetic ear for all of Cindy's problems, not being all too different from his own problems when he first started out as a Spider-Man. We get a flashback to Cindy's earlier days, how she had strict Asian parents, who were, of course, concerned with her grades and doing well in school, even though she wanted nothing more than to play street hockey. They pushed her so hard, in fact, that that was the main reason she ended up at the science exhibit that fateful day wherein she was bitten by the spider. Cindy has been unable to locate her parents ever since she came out of the bunker, and it's because of this that she's taken a job at the Fact Channel, the same channel that just so happens to employ none other than J. Jonah Jameson. Oh, and this is the best part. Cindy is so out of touch with modern culture, Jonah absolutely loves her. Ah, loves you, kid. You got spunk and moxie. You ate one of these millennials with your facing your phone all the time. You got a pad and a paper and I like it. Of course, I'm paraphrasing, but that's basically what he said. Jonah also likes that Cindy is able to get video footage of the new hero, Silk, which of course they plan to run as their top story. <laughs> wow, the more things change, the more they stay the same, right, Jonah? How long you think until he says that that Silk is a menace, I wonder? Silk dukes it out with Dragon Claw yet again, the young hero still not mastering her strength and abilities. She hits him so hard, he actually gets knocked out out of his costume. At first she thinks he might actually be dead. No, but the little bottom feeder just slinks on back to his boss, who turns out to be none other than Felicia Hardy, aka Black Cat, aka New York's newest crime kingpin. Uh, yeah, this is one of the leftovers we've been dealing with since, uh, Superior Spider-Man. There's actually supposed to be a big point one series coming later that delves more into the crime side of New York City, and Black Cat in particular. Can't wait for that. The comic ends with Cindy nowhere to go and fed up with her room deciding to crash in the bunker, the place that she was forced to call home for many years. She hopes to turn this place into a base of operations for finding her parents. The comic opens with Silk in the bowels of the New York sewer system, getting attacked by a giant tentacle monster, and oh man, I have seen enough hentai to know where all this is going. Flashback, and we see Cindy pounding the pavement, looking for information about her parents. It seems that when she was locked up in the bunker ten years ago, her parents just kind of up and disappeared, moving their stuff to store and then just kind of evaporating into thin air. Don't worry, Cindy, I'm sure your parents and little brother are fine. I'm sure they were just on vacation, you know, for the last decade. The only person who seems to have any information about what could have happened to her parents is Ezekiel, the guy who put her in the bunker, the guy who was a rich industrialist who also had a giant spider power fetish. Too bad for her, he's dead and has been dead for a while now. All this reminiscing takes Cindy back to her old neighborhood, wherein no one seems to recognize her. She has another flashback, yes, a flashback within a flashback, just kind of run with it here, about the day she broke up with her boyfriend Hector, saying that she was going to Oxford even though she wasn't really. It's then we get our Hydra robot, although this looks to be a wildly out of date Hydra robot, and it's robbing ATM machines. Silk goes after the nasty bot and ends up ringing its bell. I gotta say, the big exaggerated art style works really well in these fight scenes. When Cindy makes it out of the sewer, she is shocked and amazed to find Hector actually waiting there. However, now he has a fiancé, clearly having moved on with his own life. But oh man, that look on her face, that is pure pricelessness is what that is. I mean, that's a face that's just begging to be turned into a meme right there. Hey, internet meme community, get on that. You know, after you're done all the other important work you're doing. The comic ends with these strange shadowy figures that have been watching over Silk, saying that everything has gone according to the plan. That Hydra robot was actually just an attempt to steal some of her blood, which they now have. So, to a Silk are already in battle with the dragon dude who gave her such a hard time last issue. He's been upgraded by Black Cat's forces and now he looks, well, more like an actual dragon. Getting beaten so hard actually ends up knocking a memory loose from Cindy's head of her early days living in Ezekiel's bunker. It turns out once upon a time he actually gave her a chance to leave. He even fought her, but in the end she was just too broken and scared to ever leave. This dark trip down memory lane actually causes Cindy to freak the hell out and Silk ends up beating the guy so hard his suit falls apart. 
But before you know it, she snaps back to reality and feels really bad about what she's done. <laughs> you know, I think Silk might actually be the only hero who apologizes to villains for hitting them so hard. The Dragon Guy actually ends up having something of a sob story. He's a single dad who turned to a life of costumed criminality to help support his daughter. <laughs> and it's funny, as we find out later in the comic, guess who his daughter's favorite superhero is? Yeah, you guessed it, Silk. Cindy manages to clean up on the fight pretty good and actually sell the footage to the Fact Channel. But before you can say rain on your parade, Black Cat shows up to do just that. It's funny, Silk is so out of date on who the heroes and villains are, she actually stops and says, wait, but Black Cat, I thought you were one of the good guys. This isn't really so much a fight as it is a fact-finding mission for Black Cat. She now knows that her opponent is fast, and because of that, she will make her henchmen just as fast for when she comes at her yet again. Spider-Man comes to Silk later that night saying that he's beginning to worry about her living all on her own without any family support whatsoever. And I mean, hey, if you need a surrogate family, why don't you get the first family? Yep, that's right, the Fantastic Four show up to help out with her. No, quick, Cindy, maybe you can't trust these guys. Their new movie is getting a horrible buzz and their comic is getting cancelled. Quick, run away before they can drag you down with them. The comic opens with Cindy Moon running simulations in Reed's virtual reality machine. Who's she fighting? Well, Galactus, of course. Damn, uh, Reed, that seems like a little extreme, you know, for her first day in the simulator. Maybe, you know, go a little smaller this time around. Maybe start her off with Mole Man and have her work her way up. Damn, you just have a big old boner for Galactus, don't you? Silk is feeling anxious and she worries that there might be something wrong with her. Maybe it has something to do with the massive amounts of radiation she absorbed during the Spider-Verse, but nope, she's completely physically healthy. It's clear her afflictions are of the mental and spiritual variety, so much to the point she socked old Spider-Man in the mouth for daring to air her dirty laundry around complete strangers. And then she decides to go out on a date with Johnny Storm because, hey, Johnny's hot, isn't he? Oh, that was a terrible, unintentional pun. I am really, really sorry. We're treated to another flashback of Cindy's formative years, and in a very interesting twist, unlike Peter, she didn't hide her spider powers from her guardians, instead actually sharing it with them. One truly has to wonder the road not travel if Peter Parker had actually told Aunt May and Uncle Ben about the spider bite and about his new powers, where they would be today. I mean, yeah, it got poor Cindy locked up in a bunker telling people about her powers, but eh, you know, you never know. Silk and the Human Torch's day turns out to be anything but dinner and a movie. Instead, they decide to hit the street and fight some crime. And really, I can't think of anything more romantic than fighting crime. Oh, girl, I love the way you punch that mugger, girl. Oh, boy, I love that way that you deal that justice. Oh, uh, yeah, fight it. You step outside the law and deal the vigilante justice so good. The comic ends with Black Cat readying her army to take out Silk once and for all. As the comic opens, Cindy is still data mining in an effort to try and find out what happened to her missing parents. It's at this point we get a flashback, finding out that uh, her and her brother didn't exactly leave on good terms before she was locked away. He didn't take her whole spider powers very well. Again, I like how the writer of this book uh, once again helps differentiate Cindy from Peter. Peter was an only child. It would have been interesting to find out uh, what would have happened if he had powers, but he had a sibling who did. Cindy ends up getting some very surprising help from Jameson, of all people. Yeah, he enjoys his job at the Fact Channel, basically being the Marvel Universe's Bill O'Reilly, but in his heart of hearts, he misses the news. He misses running down a case, being a real journalist, you know? Unfortunately, Silk is needed in the city because that dragon-themed supervillain she's been mentoring has been tearing up the place. However, he does have good reason for it. Black Cat kidnapped his daughter in an attempt to pull Silk out into the open. Felicia Hardy has a whole underworld army at her back, so these two can't do it alone. Lucky for them, they get some help from the amazing Spider-Man. You know, it's funny, Silk actually blames Black Cat's fall to the dark side on Peter, which, yeah, was kinda sorta his fault, but, you know, Doc Ock was in his brain at the time, and also in his own book, he's kind of forgiven Black Cat, even though he kidnapped Aunt May and tried to light her on fire, and now Black Cat is kidnapping children in this book. I think she's beyond saving, dude. The trio raid the warehouse where the little girl is being kept to make short work of all the guards inside. Cindy actually manages to pull the girl out. Uh, as they had mentioned in a previous issue, Silk is actually her favorite hero, so this is a great moment for her. But as Admiral Akbar might say, it's a trap! Black Cat's already there with her elite group of spider slayers. Spider-Man and the Dragon Dude want to get the girl uh, as far away from all the danger as possible, which means Silk and Black Cat finally get to have a one-on-one -on -one that's been building up since the first issue. Oh, but wait, what's this? It's a swerve. It was a 
trap within a trap because Black Cat's own henchmen end up turning on her and Silk ends up getting captured. When she comes to, it seems that she's been taken captive by the same weapon maker who's been working with Black Cat, only he hasn't been working with her at all. As he puts it, he knows what happened to her parents. As the comic opens, we're treated to yet another flashback of Cindy's life before uh, entering Ezekiel's vault. She says a tearful goodbye to her mother, fearing what may happen to her next, but knowing that she's even more afraid of what happens to her if she stays out in the regular world. Wow, what a dark swerve. A young girl unable to deal with these new super changes that have been happening to her, and as such, she basically willingly gives up her own freedom. Really makes you stop and wonder, had Peter Parker been offered a similar choice, would he have taken it? When Silk comes to, she's at the mercy of Black Cat's weapon maker, who says that all of her different parts are going to sell for gangbusters on the black market. And he knows all this for a fact because he knows the people who disappeared Cindy Moon's families had deep pockets, maybe the deepest pockets he's ever seen. And if they were willing to drop that kind of money on messing with her life, then imagine what AIM or HYDRA or any of the other terrorist groups would pay to get their hands on Silk. Cindy is only saved at the last second by the very surprise intervention of Black Cat. Black Cat who was trying to kill her in the previous issue, but is now way more ticked off at one of her subordinates turning rogue. So now Silk finds herself in the very awkward position of trying to save the guy who not a minute ago was trying to dissect her. Unfortunately for our hero, this building, like many in New York, is not up to code, and a big part of the ceiling ends up crashing down on the dude, killing him in the fight. Enraged by losing her best lead to finding her family in a long time, Silk attacks Black Cat, even going as far as to cut her own hair to escape from a hold that she was in. In a true scene of badassery, Cindy even ends up webbing up one of her hands, making not quite a boxing glove, but not quite a hand wrap either, so she can better wail on Felicia. She's still unfortunately very much a rookie, and Black Cat manages to slip away. Spider-Man shows up to comfort Cindy, and we get a nice bit of dialogue that ties back into the very first panel. Cindy saying that life in the real world is really hard. At least when she lived in the vault, things never hurt this badly. It is perhaps a good thing, then, that when she returns to the vault and has herself a little temper tantrum, she's able to uncover one of the many cameras that have been spying on her this whole time, as well as a note. A note that certainly Silk will have no end of time to catch up on, because, I mean, it's not like it's the end of the world or anything. Sitting in a psychiatrist's office, on one hand, it's really nice to see her try and seek some psychological help for her issues. On the other hand, and though she may have picked the worst possible time as the incursions are happening right now. Hey, on the upswing though, this time tomorrow everyone will probably be dead, which means you probably won't get charged for this session. I mean, you know, gotta look at this glass as half full, huh? huh? If nothing else, Jameson, who I still gotta say has absolutely been killing it in this book from issue one, has come through on his promise to help Cindy in her quest to find her family. He may very well have a hot lead on her brother, or at least someone claiming to use her brother's name who was in Involved with the Goblin Nation. Yeah, it seems old Albert Moon may very well have fallen down a very dark path in the time since his sister left. Cindy races across town to try and get to the halfway house where he's staying, but because the incursions are happening, it's complete and utter chaos. And even though it's complete and utter chaos, and even though this may very well be her last chance to spend any time with her family, Cindy, being the hero that she is, makes sure that Silk makes as many stop as possible to save people from all the destruction, even getting pinned under a bus for all of her trouble. It's here we're treated to yet another flashback scene, which have been one of the more unique aspects of the Silk book since the very beginning. We we see the day that Silk actually left for Ezekiel's vault, and the fact that Cindy did not say goodbye to her brother when she left, something that she's been beating herself up about pretty much non-stop. In the end, though, she's saved by Rage, the want-to-be dragon-themed supervillain whose daughter she saved back in a previous issue from Black Hat, now returning the favor. Silk tells him that this may be his last chance to spend some time with his daughter, and that he'd better go right now as quick as his feet can carry him. Aw, she even goes as far as to give him a little smooch on the cheek. How adorable. In the end, Silk finds her way to the halfway house where her brother is. She goes into his room and is surprised to see that he has actually been looking for her, his wall covered in news clippings of Silk. Brother and sister embrace each other one time, talk about how much they love each other, 
and then the white light of the incursions washes over them as the comic ends. Silk Number 7 is a comic that definitely had a hard task to accomplish, and that is how do you write the last days of story for a hero like Silk who is so damn new? Honestly though, I think they do a pretty good job pulling it off, helped out by the fact that the art has definitely taken an upgrade since the last issue. As always, what I find so compelling about Cindy Moon is just how simple and relatable her quest and her mission is outside being a hero. She just wants to find her family. I also think the whole Silk news clipping on the brother's wall is a nice bit of storytelling without actually needing to do words. And while the final page is an Ant-Man levels of gut punch, it's still pretty strong. Overall, I give this one a very much deserved 7.5 out of 10. Definitely, if you've been digging Silk, you definitely need to read this one. Hey guys, Joel here reminding you that this video was made possible thanks to our many great patrons. If you want to become a patron and get exclusive comic book cast content, then click the Patreon link below and see how you can help us bring you the content you've come to love. Every little bit helps, and thanks for listening.